Good morning. Uh, Your Honor, it's good to have you here today. I don't know if you know our mayor, uh, Esther Smith, but uh, we're happy to have her here with us this morning and welcome. Today's message may indeed be part of the reason that I'm not feeling well today. Today I want to talk about demonic danger. And as we do this, I want to go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him for our guidance. Heavenly Father, as we open scripture today and as we approach this topic, we want the truth. And we want the truth to get into our ears, into our eyes, and into our hearts. And we want it to change us, and we want it to mold us and to shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. And Father, I pray that that you would speak through me. I pray that the scripture would be powerful as it's intended to be, and that the message you've given me would be communicated in a way that will be understood. I pray also, Lord, for your protection over this flock, and we pray for your protection over this town and this area. And we love you, Father, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Within just a few blocks of where I'm standing right now and where you're sitting are some new practices in town. Two that have begun advertising services of the spiritual nature. And the spiritual services that they offer are spiritual services straight from hell. And today I'm not going to pull any punches, and today I'm going to be extremely serious, and and we need to take this serious. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about um, demonic activity and what that means and what it is and what it isn't. And there are two extremes that Christians seem to gravitate toward. Not very many in the middle. There are many Christians who say, you know, most of that stuff was in Jesus' day. And because Jesus walked the earth and in the days before Jesus, because of his eventual coming, there was all this demonic activity, but not so much today. And, and they just kind of, you know, shove it off and it's, it's not for today. And that sister and that brother is a wrong look at demonic activity. The other side of the fence believes that everything is demonic activity. If your toast burns in the morning, that was Satan. If you put your left shoe on your right foot, that's Satan. That's dangerous too. We need to have a right look at what this is. And and I'm going to take two looks at this, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. If you haven't gotten there already, turn to Acts chapter 19. There's a reason we're going to look in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, we're going to see things that are happening in our age, in the church age. The things that are happening in Acts are things that happen today. When we look at the Old Testament... I want you to see God's heart on the issue. God's heart is found in the Old Testament. It's found in the New Testament. But if you want to know what God thinks about something, what his heart says about something, what makes him angry, what pleases him, go to the Old Testament. His heart is laid wide open for you to know that. And so we're going to do that. Look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. It happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Let's go on down to verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, I cannot explain that, but I believe it 
because it's in Scripture. What an incredible time to be a Christian and, and, to, and to see this kind of thing happening. Uh, don't see it today. Now, we've seen, uh, we've seen fakers try to do this kind of thing. And, and for just X number of dollars, there's people who will send you a prayer cloth. Paul, I don't see him asking for dollars. I don't see him uh, with some uh, infomercial. When it says in verse 11, God worked unusual miracles, I think that is the understatement right there. God worked unusual, curious miracles, and that's God's prerogative to do that. Does he work unusual miracles today? He sure does. I've seen some where I, there's just no way, but it had to be God to reach into someone's life and make a change that only he can make. You've probably seen it too. Maybe you've discussed it away and and, you know, for God, we kind of fall into both of those extreme categories, too. Either he really doesn't do those things today, or everything is something that he's done. And, and uh, I'll tell you what, when God really touches a life, you'll know it. You'll know it, because he touches it good. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, so these sweaty Work clothes, basically, of Paul, his handkerchiefs, his bandanas, his, his aprons, his work aprons, he's a tent maker. Th these articles of clothes, if they could sneak them away from Paul and touch the sick with them, they were healed. That part of the story is told so that we can understand a little more about verse 13. Look at verse 13. Then... Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So these itinerant Jewish exorcists, I'm I'm sure the King James Version uses that same word, itinerant. I don't know if you know what that is. Today we'd call these gypsies. We'd call them, uh, we'd call them drifters. We'd call them, uh, 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 I don't know, we'd call them some things probably we shouldn't call them. But they're drifters. They, they are vagabonds. And they are hobos. And they're out for a quick dollar. It doesn't mean that they weren't ever successful at what they did. But it says it took, they took it upon themselves. They heard of Paul and they began using the name of Jesus. Do people today use the name of Jesus for their own benefit? They do. Do people who you see their life, and Jesus said that we'll know a tree by its fruit, are there people today that by their fruit you would say they are never a Christian. They, they have not had a day when they've given their life to the Lord. It just doesn't show in their life, but they use the name of Jesus for supposedly these magical, wonderful miracles. There are people today who do that, and they do it for their own fame, and they do it for cash. We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. That just sounds weird. Not by the Jesus I believe in, but by the Jesus Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons. Verse 15, and the evil spirit answered in one case, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? chills. The skin had to be crawling on these guys when they heard the demon speak back. And, and they had it coming, by the way. We exercise you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. We don't know him, but we're using his name. Now the demons know Paul very well, and the demons know Jesus very well. But who do you think you are asking me to be cast out? 
And so what happened? Then the man, verse 16, in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. In this disaster of an exorcism, Jesus was magnified. Jesus will be magnified, by the way. He will, he will make sure that his name is lifted above all names. In your disaster or in your victory, Jesus will be magnified. And so the name of Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Can I argue that? The value of these magic books was zero. <laughs> Absolutely zero. To the world, they were worth 50 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Jesus will use you as a good example or a bad example, one or the other, for his glory. And he used these gypsy-type Jews as a bad example to draw people to him. I think it's interesting that once this incident happened, it was either in a place that was public where there were witnesses or the story was so compelling because of the condition of the men after this, where the Spirit tore them up and nearly killed them, that it made believers out of the town. And the town went into their homes, and in the homes were found magic books, uh, books on how to cast spells, and books of evil intention, books of spiritism, books of spiritualism, books that that you can find in homes in Titusville today. I guarantee it. If you haven't heard of Wiccans, if you haven't heard of warlocks and witches in Titusville, they are here and they are becoming thick. I run into them all the time. How do you know they are, Jim? I've never had anyone tell me. All you have to do is mention the name of Jesus to them, and they reveal themselves to you. When I was driving the bus, I ran into a couple of Wiccans. When I was shoveling my snow last winter, a fella stopped me. He was a Wiccan. How did I know? I offered him a Bible tract and talked to him about Jesus, and he stopped me in my tracks. Titusville is becoming a home for the occult. Is that new? It's not necessarily new. But they're becoming more bold in it. And there are two businesses, one on South Franklin and one on South Washington, who now are offering spiritual services, spiritual readings, contact with the dead. We should pay attention to that and lift that to the Lord in prayer. You want to know what my prayer is, and I know on Tuesday night we had a little prayer meeting here, and I know I shocked at least one person when I prayed this prayer, Lord, either save them or destroy them. Either save them or destroy them. I'm concerned with their souls. But save them or pack them up and send them away. Save them or remove them, Lord. Save them or make them vanish. You can do that, Lord. He's the one with the power to do that. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to learn God's heart on this. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, he's talking about the promised land, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes 
his son or his daughter passed through the fire, and Molech was the one that they would pass a child through the fire to honor, to praise, to worship. They were killing their children. You know what, we're, we're today, we're killing our children before they're born. They were just doing it a little later. Abortion is wrong, folks. It is murder. There shall not be found among you, verse 10 says again, anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist. Brothers and sisters, those are the words that are used today for these practices. They don't even try to hide it. Those are the words that are called out today. In the advertisements for the one on Franklin Street, these are the words they use. And they've got people praising them for coming to town with this. Verse 12, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because these abomina of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. How are you blameless? By not touching them, not being part of them, not participating in them, not purchasing from them, not being their customer. Stay away. For these nations, verse 14, which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, listen, as for you, child of God, as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. These are not for you. Look at me for a minute. These things are not for you. The Lord your God, verse 15, will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses says, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. Moses speaks of Jesus Christ. You want to be spiritual? You go to Jesus Christ. You want to know what the future is? You go to the Word of God. You want to know God's will for your life? You don't need to contact the dead. You need to contact Jesus Christ. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19 and verse 31. Genesis, Exodus. Leviticus. Again, we're, we're understanding the heart of God our Father. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. He says, I want you to know I'm your Lord. Don't go after these things. Now, Leviticus 19 is an interesting chapter. It is the only chapter in the Bible that calls out that you're not supposed to tattoo yourself. I know we got people here with tattoos, and I know how popular it is. Don't let me demonize tattoos, but let me say this. There are signs in a person's life. This is not going to be popular. There are signs in a person's life that you need to be aware of. The people who are going to gravitate toward these kind of businesses may show these kind of signs. Excessive piercings, excessive tattooing. They're going to be the smokers, the chewers. They're going to be the drug users. They're going to be the smokers of marijuana. These are going to be the ones that play filthy music. These are the ones who can't say a sentence without a vulgar word in it. And, and we ignore those signs. I like the, you know, frankly, I like the Baptist thing that says, uh, we don't smoke, we don't chew, and we don't go with those who do. I like that. You know what? We just ignore some simple signs, some common sense, that the people who are doing the things that our mamas told us not to do are probably a good idea to stay away from those people. Steer clear. 
And the people who are talking spiritualism, spiritism, mediums who are talking horoscopes, who are talking palm reading, keep away from them. God is going to gobble them up in his wrath. That is not an area you want to be in when that happens. You don't want to be in their circle of influence when that happens. Leviticus 20 and verse 6, you're right there. Leviticus 20 and verse 6. Again, I want to know your heart, O God. Verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits prostitute himself with them. To prostitute himself with them, I set my face against. You become an enemy of God. When you chum around, when you mess around, when you dabble in this stuff, when you're interested in it, when it just tickles your curiosity, so i got to spend some time on the internet looking into it. Maybe I'll watch a couple of YouTube videos about a seance or, or a palm reading. Maybe I'll find out uh, about this uh, soul-sucking thing that goes on. I don't know if you're familiar with that. People lay on graves to suck the soul out of the grave. It's crazy the things people do, and, and the Lord says, the person who turns to these things, I'm his enemy. I don't want God as my enemy. Do you? Verse 27. A man or woman who is a medium or who has, a fam has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. There are people in town right now calling themselves wizards, calling themselves witches, calling themselves warlocks. The one lady I had in my bus when I drove was telling me that she was studying up on how to cast a curse. She worshiped squirrels and trees. That is exactly Romans chapter 1, worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Revelation 21, verse 8. I love to hear the pages turning. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, I think we've already established that these practices are abominable, whether you're a customer or whether you're the proprietor. The abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is no joke. And before you say, I'm not any part of that, and you start looking around the room who might be, check out the rest of the list. This is a nice list. Sexually immoral, the unbelieving, the cowardly, idolaters, what's getting between you and God? But the list includes sorcerers, and it includes the abominable. I'm going to read a couple of verses to you you don't have to turn to, but you might want to take a note. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. Let me repeat that. I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is that telling me? That's telling me that the heart of my Father in heaven that I see in the Old Testament, his heart hasn't changed on this. His heart has not changed on this. Why am I being so firm about this? Because Christian people, people who say that they are Christians, are beginning to praise these two businesses that are opening up. They're saying, how wonderful that we have another spirit-filled place in town. How wonderful. I can go get a massage and I can get a, a spirit reading. Oh, how wonderful. I might be able to contact Grandma. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 3, if you'll get there. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 3. 
Well, Jim, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna visit one of those places, but your granddaughter might. Well, Jim, I've never, I've never had a fortune telling or anything else, but your, your daughter might, your neighbor might. It'd be a good thing to be able to advise them, right? 1 Samuel 28, verse 3, now Samuel had died, he was the prophet. Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritus out of the land. Saul, the king of Israel, the first king of Israel, did something right. He followed what God wanted and he put out all of these soothsayers, fortune tellers, the mediums, the spiritists, he put them out, got rid of them. Verse 4, then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. This was typical for Saul. He was easily frightened. Very little faith in God. Verse 6, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Saul had already crossed the line with God. Saul had an audience with God, and then he disobeyed in a way that God said, I'm done with you. David is my man. And when you're extinguished, David will be king. And so God stopped talking. To Saul, that's an awful place to be. That is an awful place to be. Verse 7, then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium. Saul didn't get on his knees and say, why aren't you answering me, God? I'm coming in repentance. I'm sorry for what I did. Knowing our God as you know him, I think God would have maybe listened to a repentant Saul, king of Israel king of God's people, but instead immediately find me, a, find me a woman who's a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Servants knew right where to find her. That's shocking too. He put them out, but he didn't put them very far out. And as much as you want to sweep this town clean, this is an important sermon because we won't be able to do that. Mayor, we won't be able to do that. They're going to be here. That influence is going to be here. Ungodly people are going to be here. We're not going to be able to rid them. We need to be strong in the spirit, strong in the word of God. As Paul says, so that we'll stand in that day, putting on the armor of God, taking up the sword of the spirit, ready to do battle. I love this part here because it speaks so much to Satan's tricks and Satan's tactics. In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Now, you all, I'm going to make a note there just for a minute so I know where I left off. You all may say, you are taking this way too far, Jim. You're taking this too serious. Guess what? You're on that end of the scale over there. But there was a show on television called Bewitched. And, and my wife and I used to watch it all the time. Cute little show about witchcraft. It was the wrong show for us to watch, I guarantee you. And in that show, the mother-in-law of the witch was Endora. Do you remember that? Where do you think they got that name? That is no mistake. It came right here from Endor. You don't think the writers were being driven to call out that name? Satan had a chuckle on that one, I'm sure. Endor. Verse 8, so Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. And he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said, please conduct a seance for me. In other words, contact the dead. Conduct a seance for me and bring up 
for me the one I shall name for you. Then the woman said to him, look, you know that Saul has uh, what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? She knows the rules. She doesn't know that Saul. Not a very good medium. <laughs> and sw Saul swore to her by the Lord. <laughs> Saul swore to her by the Lord saying, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. That's a promise he can't keep. Because God says that these people are to die. What happened? She called up the dead. The scripture plainly says she called up Samuel. And it was nothing good beyond that. We need to know that That God doesn't tell us that we can't go to these things and participate in them. He doesn't tell us that because they're fakes. He tells us that because many times they're real and they're dangerous. And they will pull you and snare you. And sometimes people never get away from it. They are snared forever in Satan's trap. New Age, that's what a lot of this goes on today. You'll hear the ter term New Age, your antenna should go up. You should beware when you hear New Age regarding any of those kind of services. If you think that a, that a, a place that is selling incense and, uh, and selling uh, rocks that you, uh, that you hold and it re relieves stress and you see New Age, that's what we're talking about. Spirits, familiar spirits, psychics, spirit readers, astrologers, channeling the dead, palm reading, Ouija boards, tea leaf reading, tarot cards, seances, fortune telling, sorcery, crystal gazing, horoscopes, magic, voodoo, incantations, martial arts. If you don't know that karate and jujitsu and these Eastern warfare things come with religion, come with calling upon spirits, you're out of the loop because they're part of it. Numerology, hypnosis, yoga is dangerous. I know you want to exercise. Pull up a Jack LaLanne video. Don't go to yoga classes. They are dangerous. Why, Jim? Anything that tells you to empty your mind, any exercise, any sport, any therapy that says empty yourself is dangerous. God doesn't say empty yourself. He says, fill yourself with my spirit. Jesus, Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 12. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, and he finds none. Then he says, I'll return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. You empty yourself, and if you don't fill that void with God, if you don't fill that with the Spirit and the Word of God, you are a prime candidate to be filled with the wrong stuff. You think you're getting a jelly donut? You're getting death donut, full of death, full of abomination. It's dangerous, these arts that say to empty yourself, to free your mind, empty your mind. Why do they want that? So that they can put their trash in. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
You need to know that in, in the human mind and in the human heart, there's never an empty vacuum. It's always full of something. Christians, fill yourself with this word and let the Spirit fill you. Don't leave an empty spot. Don't leave a dark spot. Surrender these sins. Get them out of your life. Create a place where God can fill you and overflow you. He says you'll have rivers of living water. Rivers of it. That means when I get near somebody that's lost, they're going to get splashed. They're going to know the Holy Spirit because I'm going to share Christ with them. I'm not going to share fortune telling with them. What do we do? We pray. I want you to know that we are in a spiritual war. And I'm looking out over faces that I love. And I want to tell you, there might be one or two of you up for the battle. You do not want to take this enemy on by yourself. I've seen people take on Satan by themselves. He'll ruin you. That's why Paul says to put on the armor. Those pieces of armor aren't pieces of armor. They're disciplines in your life. I'm telling you, don't confront that enemy. Call on the name of the one that the enemy fears. The demons believe in Jesus, and they tremble, Scripture says. Call on Jesus for these things. If it's in your family today, there may be somebody here. Maybe that's your unspoken request on a Sunday morning, is that you've got a daughter or a son or a grandkid who's deep into fortune-telling, who is deep into spiritualism, who is reading Confucius, who is doing things that they should not do that are called abominations in the Bible. Call on Jesus. He is all-powerful. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Don't go alone. Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6, and we're done. 2 Corinthians 6, and verse 14. What can I do, Jim? How can I make a difference, Jim? I want God to reveal to me how I can make a difference in this battle. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's what you can do. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What business do you have, is what he's saying. What business do you have with these dark arts? What business do you have with a spiritist, with a medium, with a fortune teller, with a spirit reader. Some, some, maybe even in this room, because of your curiosity, will look at the sign, will look at the advertisement on these buildings here in town, and you'll say, well, they've got essential oils. They've got these fragrances. They've got scented candles. You don't need that scented candle. You, you do not need that. You are risking your soul to do that, and you're, listen to me, you're risking the souls of your family. You're risking the souls of other Christians in this room because they'll see you and they'll say, it must be okay. If Jim goes in there, it must be okay. Hey, don't go in there and tell them Jesus says this. Nobody needs to see you go into those places. What does Paul say? Don't be unequally yoked, but he goes on. He says in verse 16, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Hey, the temple doesn't belong there, by the way. 
As God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be their people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. That means don't mix. Don't get into it. Don't get into it. You're awful excited, Jim. I am. I want this flock protected. I want you to get this message. We don't belong there. Your mother used to say, I don't want you playing with him anymore. I don't want you going with her anymore. There was a reason, and there's a reason for this. Don't go there. You don't belong there, Christian. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He says, if you will do that, all is well. I will be your daddy, and you will be my child, and I will protect you. Now, I'm not going to stand here, and I'm not going to name those two businesses. And my heart loves the people who are there, but I don't like what they're doing. And, I, and my prayer truly is for the Lord to save them. But if the Lord says they're never going to be saved because he knows the beginning from the end, that business needs to be destroyed. And we need to pray for that. Taken out of this community. If you're not snared by it, your child may be. If your child isn't snared by it, your grandchild may be. And it's only the beginning. If we don't take this to God, God's going to say, well, they're fine with it. Fine, just have that. Just have it. And it's just going to grow, and it's going to become more dangerous. Now, I love this town, don't you, Mayor? I love this town. And I love this community. I love this congregation. Don't go there. Don't recommend to go there. Pray to God. If you're here today and you're hearing this message and you're saying this is serious and here I am sitting here and I, I've not given my life to Christ yet. Don't be a fool. Don't walk out of here without surrendering your life totally to Jesus Christ. He loves you. He is the one who publicly took your sin, and allowed that shame to be displayed on him so that you don't have to do that. He has your best, your best in mind. If you're a Christian and you're dabbling in fortune telling, you're taking a little peeky-poo at the horoscope, If you're counting on lady luck, if you're tapping the internet for a psychic reading, if you're being excited at the supernatural stuff at the checkout stand, you need to repent today, right now. You need to repent. It's an abomination to our God the one who saved you. Let's go to prayer.